Yeah, I think the mindset is a big thing in poker and uh, you might not be a good player, but if you get, if you have the, the, the right mindset, you will become one. All right, so we're live with the champ 2020 WSOP main event champion here on the podcast i'm super excited to finally meet the you. online champion no no they like to, no, to no, say. no 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 you're the world champion there's no i think it might even be more uh, prestigious because i find online is tougher so i think that deserves even more respect for your title that you competed and you defeated with I think more than five, seven thousand runners. I don't even know the exact number, but who cares? Yeah, I think it was like five thousand eight hundred, something yeah. like that. Potato, I'm potato. Sure you beat I... millions of other players that also tried to satellite, right? So it's probably more than mm -hmm. that if we consider all the satellites. So very well deserved title. How did it feel the first minutes after? you realized fuck i won this thing after you had the yeah, final hand oh, man. so much emotions went through my system it was just amazing i never felt something like that in my life actually it was like i'm on drugs or something <laughs> like so much adrenaline going i just had to scream and jump to express these emotions I actually made uh, some made some story. I saw it. Yeah, Instagram. you were speechless. I didn't, I didn't expect to <laughs> be so popular, but yeah, it was amazing, man. How did you? How did your family react? Did you call someone and told them, "Hey, I shipped it," or what happened? They were actually super happy about it. Because they don't know much about poker, they just know I, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't expect them to realize what's what's actually happening because I had won some smaller tournaments in the past or something and I expected them to take it like something normal. But yeah. uh, they realized pretty quickly when I said world champion and they were super happy i i never saw them so happy either it was great maybe the best time in my life for sure actually it's the best time and the next day when you woke up was it like am i dreaming what's happening how long did it take yeah, you for to was... to calm down to realize what was actually happening yeah man it was like um everything changed like everyone uh, starts approaching you they message you they call you and uh, I didn't expect so much attention coming with the win so uh, it, it felt so different than my normal days and uh, then I started questioning myself <laughs> what the fuck is this some dream or something I mean now I'm a world champion, I guess. When everybody started calling me and uh, greeting me, then I realized how this, how big this is actually, because I played many tournaments and, uh, you know, for me, it was a great win with this huge result. And uh, of course, winning a bracelet. But when I saw how important this is and how much people are getting inspired of my win actually that was a big thing some people were saying to me oh my god you you played so amazing this is great i'm so inspired right now I, you motivate me stuff like that and i was wow i guess this is really significant you know something like that and um uh, then I realized how big it is actually to to have this uh, title on your world champion. And all these years of playing and grinding and achieving this, I guess this makes everything um, 
meaningful how the grind and stuff and uh no yeah we it's, sorry go ahead yeah and i still feel uh, pretty young you now I, I haven't reached 30 yet so i said to myself self okay now i did this which is apparently super difficult and i have so many years ahead of me how much things in life actually can be achieved and how many like life is so rich rich and if i can do that what it will be after 20 more years or something how many options and opportunities are out there are you gonna plan are you gonna intend to keep playing poker if so what are your plans which games do you intend to play yeah everyone is asking that and i don't really have an answer yet for that for sure i i will continue to play poker but i don't know what <clears throat> and um in which uh, sphere i will compete is will it be cash games tournaments online live what stakes i'm not really sure i, I don't know how to work with this bankroll have to make my plans yet you know and um i guess this will happen in the upcoming days and weeks and i'll have some future plans but probably i'll play more live tournaments mm -hmm. and uh maybe i'll be playing a little bit more often mtts I'm coming from spin and go background. Oh, really? You know, this format, yeah. Interesting. But I actually think we, we've played some five hundred dollars. Oh, uh, really? Did we? Yeah, I see my 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 self in your streams. Ah, why didn't you say yeah. something, dude? I I was nobody, so <laughs> I guess. No, but, I wanted all uh, my playing against. I always find it very interesting. It was fun playing with you because it's not your regular stake, uh, regular format, but yeah, you're actually a tough opponent. You put you put players in test, and uh, you have buffs in every spot, which you know how it works. Yeah, make you. To be fair, it's, it is actually my background, just not without with the antis, and I haven't been playing sit and goes. I've played sit and goes for five, six, seven years. So I'm. Mm -hmm. I feel very, very confident. Confident playing 20, 25 big blinds, five, 15 big blinds. I played thousands of heads ups, which you ultimately play in in spin and goes. I will for sure have some leaks because I'm not familiar with uh, with uh, without entities, and you always have entities in sit and goes. So this makes mm -hmm. it a bit more different, and I'm probably a little bit too loose in some of the spots, but. Overall, I think I, I have a good idea on, on how to approach these. But yeah, it's for sure. It's for sure good for sharpening your game, right? Like, especially in tournament poker. And I think this this also really helped you. And I can see this correlation over and over again where people with a sit and go background or a short stack background always do quite well in tournaments because most of the time you're going to play 20 big blinds, 30 big blinds, and the money making or most money-making decisions are around that stack size. It's not about the check-raising bluffs for 50 big blinds early game on the river. The most money is at stake at this late stage, but very often you, you're going to be open shoving for 10 big blinds. You're going to be calling and all in 15 big blinds, right? So it's like you really need to be very aware with that stack size what, what kind of ranges you want to play. And we also talked about this in the podcast with Pets, and I always feel like people have a wrong approach on studying the game. And they know all the GTO bullshit for, it's not bullshit, but when it comes to prioritization, I, f I feel like that people are overdoing it and studying way too much post flop 100 big blinds and, and, and defending ranges. Start, I, I, I would prefer being very, very strong with 20, 30 big blinds than being very strong with 100 big blinds. And now I, it, it makes sense because you you played very well against the, the shortest stacks and you applied a lot of pressure because you know how wide you can jam, you know, you know how wide you can, you can steal or how wide you can defend. And it, it does. Yeah. So it, it makes sense. I'm not surprised. How long, when did you start playing spin and goes? Was it the first format that you started playing or was it something else? And then you transitioned into spin and goes. Yeah, not at all. The first one, 
I've played a bunch of heads up cash before that, mm -hmm. and uh, I have always played some MTTs on the Sundays or I mean, yeah, when I when there is something interesting, like yeah, when there's cool. a lot of money, right? Then it's worth your time jumping in, huh? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's fun because everyone plays them. There, there's big money, yeah, and yeah, double coups and scoops and all the series nowadays. Not only in stars, but also the other rooms, like party and etc. And it's so much stuff to play actually yeah. nowadays. I don't know if you're an MTT grinder, you don't have a, a break and a rest day, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but um, I started playing Spin and Ghosts like in 2017. I played Heads Up Hypers for a couple of years. And then uh, with all the wars for Wobbies and stuff, they got really, you know, tough. Yeah, tough and mm, annoying. Yeah. And uh, Spin and Ghosts were just rising. So. I took a shot because it's a really close format mm. and um, yeah, it went really good in the since the beginning and uh, I played them till now actually reached the, the higher stakes like 500 and um, uh, also it's very helpful for your MTT game like you said. I want to add everything to, to, what, to everything you said also. Mm. You VPP the most in the later positions, like playing the button, the small blind, the big blind, you VPP the most. So yeah. that's probably the most important positions to understand and study and work on post flop, pre flop. Um, so <laughs> with all the studying I did in spinning goals, I think this, this is very applicable in MTT poker because I feel even the regular players are missing some important stuff in those positions. Yeah. You know, and with the large ranges, you can probably be more creative, I guess. So mm -hmm. it's more skill involved than UTG range against uh, some middle position range where you can pretty easily figure out what are the ranges yeah. pre flop and what has to happen on the flop yeah but it's more defined right with icm is completely different so when we reached the final stages it, it was um it was helpful but i have to i had to adjust it so much um considering my stack and the payout yeah for sure i mean what what really what really stood out for me, not only during the tournament now, also why you briefly summarize your poker journey is that one very spectacular hand. And of course, on day three, I was also watching the stream and I've seen that insane laydown. So, I mean, we have seen that you can be very aggressive, but you can also make good laydowns. And I think this is very often being overseen that in a tournament it's it is very often about making good laydowns i mean you never know what would have happened if you would have lost that key hand i think it's like how many chips have you had at this point it was you you weren't i started away. the day hmm? i started the day 13 chips and that was the first hand of the day yeah but it was i remember it was a five million bet the pot was five million he slightly over bet how many chips did you have behind on uh, not the, sure because i played in big blinds but um you, you mean on the river yeah i remember his bet like was like 22 big blinds into a pot of 25 i might be a little wrong about i think numbers, it was an over bet i think he slightly over bet the river but yeah, whatever but if it, it was doesn't... an over bet it was a slight one i think it was around the pot yeah, yeah, it was very like I think it, he just put one or two big blinds on top, as an overbet. But I mean, it's mm. it's it is, it's a significant amount of of chips in, uh, that are at risk. Yeah, if, it was for you... sure a polarizing bet, and that was really difficult hand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So 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 let's talk about that hand for for those who 
didn't know what happened. We're going to put an overlay, so we give you a little bit of an of an um, uh, overview of, of, about the hand. So oh, another thing on open raises, I think you were three way, right? Someone from button or small blind caught as well. You overcall the big blind. Yeah, the UTG brand Picholi. I don't know how it's pronounced, yeah. but uh, Brian raised yeah. UTG. Yeah. It was the chip leader in the tournament. I was 13 in chips. Then the cutoff code, um, I defended the big blind with taste five of hearts. Um, then four king eight, yeah, four king eight with two hearts. hearts yeah. Uh, give me the first draw, the not first draw was the flop. And then Brian made a C bet. Um, cutoff code, I think. I called, uh, turn is king of hearts, giving me the flush. So now, probably I shouldn't lead there, but um, yeah, felt like people will not put enough chips in the pot on this turn card. And uh, I decided to lead it. Um, yeah, because don't expect someone to make big bluffs there. I think it's okay. It's it's good to. I mean, you you certainly will have more king x than everyone else. You will have more flushes, right? You call overcall from the big blind. Um, you can have yeah, some yeah, some sure. traps. I mean, you're probably going to be raising a lot of two pairs on the flop, but so you're not going to have the like absolute nuts. But I think like in terms of second nuts, third nuts, and it's not that you were betting super large. I think it it easily. Yeah, it was some stop bet. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's close in EV either way, but I decided to lead it. Yeah. And then Brand caught me, mm -hmm. pretty fast call, I believe. And the other guy, the cutoff folded. Um, the river was jack of hearts, so now there were four hearts on the board. I have the nut flush. Uh, decided to check, and he fired a huge bet like 22 big blinds in 24 or 5 i believe it was you say it was a slight over bet not sure what was it the hint is it in youtube matter. anyway yeah. everyone can check it um but it was a polarizing bet um it didn't make sense for him to value bet queen of hearts there with this sizing yeah um so and also, when I lead the turn, uh, there are not many non-hard pocket pair type of hands, which are basically the nature of bluffs on the river. So mostly he has some showdown value with his pocket pairs with a heart, which yeah. he should check behind. And then he can fire with some bolts and the nut flush. So I have the nut flush, so it's impossible. And then only boats remaining. They are King Eight suited. The sets on the flop, which is eight and uh, what was it? And four fours, fours and eight, eight fours. Yeah, pocket jacks yeah, are also a possibility. Probably. Yeah, sure. He was chip leader. You could have something like Jack Eight King suited Jack. as well. Opening. Mm, maybe yeah. yeah. Uh, King Jack. King yeah, Jack, there, yeah. there's some actually some a lot of boats, boats possible, right? And you're not blocking any of, of those. A lot of boats, yeah. yeah. To be honest, a lot of boats. I mean, what do you think he's, so I, he's bluffing with? Yeah, that was actually what I was thinking with all my, with all with all the time, I I, I took. I mean, sometimes he might get sick and probably turn his bottom range into a buff some sixes with the heart or sevens just to try push me off some queen or my but is hand. he really calling sixes yeah. sevens when you he's going to be very often drawing dead against better flushes on the turn right so and sure he still has someone that, that he still has someone behind right so he's probably not even gonna, not gonna have those mm. what do you yeah, think about it's, it's his hard one. what do you think about his king to tens like th these are the ones that I feel if I think about my range the way I would play it, I don't I don't know how you play your range and and uh, under the gun, but what do you think about turning, let's say, your king nine and clubs into a bl into a bluff, 
right? I can't think of any worse hands that I can have there. If I have pocket tens with one heart, you have enough showdown value against your trips. So I don't really see the point in bluffing. And most of the time, I'm either going to have yeah. trips or I will. Yeah, like, obviously, I thought that an ace high push. So if I do that, there is some sense in doing it. But it's becoming a really guessing game because I guess some some people yeah. just snap calls the ace high push. And you don't ever know in these situations because they are so rare. Yeah, yeah. So there is some feeling involved, but just logically, it was really hard spot to bluff. And uh, losing so much, such a big pot changes completely your opportunities in the tournament. You have to VPP less after mm. becoming short and a pay jump coming after two guys butting. So that made it actually like hook an easy fold, but I took my time to trying to think of some buff, which yeah. probably he may, might buff. And then I decided just to fold it and stay strong. <laughs> you did, you did. And honestly, when I think about the tournaments where I went deep, no matter if I won it or I got third, I always feel like there was one key hand where it was not that I did a crazy bluff. It was very often a situation where I was able to preserve my chips that later on I had a bigger double up. Also in the main event, I had a situation where I had 25 big blinds, 30 big blinds, pocket tens. I raised from under the gun, but I faced a three bet. I know people know I'm going to be opening a little wider so I can easily justify myself. Okay, you know, you have less than 30 big blinds, pocket tens, let's just forbid jam, right? Mm -hmm. It's like everyone would, be say, would say it's a setup if you run into better hand. Like nobody would say you should study it, you should look it up. Okay, it's a cooler move on. But I, I don't know, I had a bad feeling with the timing. This guy was not in particular aggressive. And I knew the EV of jamming and calling is identical. And I felt I have such a big edge in this field that I just called. And flop was, I, don't th I think, like, queen queen whatever or king king whatever and he had queens or jacks with the under pair i paid two bets but i was still left with 18 or 20 big blinds or like 16 big blinds i don't know and then two hands later i doubled up so usually i would have went out and i think this is what i'm always trying to tell people if you're not 100 percent sure then go the safe route like it's not that you're gonna lose insane amount of bbs there the difference there of, of jamming m might be 0 0.05 big blinds, right? But yeah. I don't give a fuck about that if I'm not 100% sure that this is a superior play. Especially if even if I mm. lose a few chips there in the long run because I make a more passive play, I can win it back, especially if you play soft fields, if you give yourself an edge. So it's it's really great to see that you pay attention to those to those, I wouldn't even say details because it's not a detail. It's actually very important in tournaments that you, you really see your chips as an army and every soldier that you send into the battlefield, yeah, you want to protect it, right? And yeah. I feel like people are just using, oh, I got so many chips, okay, let's let's throw in some chips and see what he <laughs> has. That, you're not going to win the war and you're going to be run, running out of chips very soon, right? Yeah, you know, you have to know when to sacrifice the soldiers, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's uh, really the... An interesting aspect of the tournaments, which make make them probably so exciting, because uh, your tournament wife always have some EV out there, and no one yet, I guess, estimated how significant this EV is. Some some guys don't take it into account so much; just try to play cheap PV. Some guy guys give it so much respect and probably play it so tight like if you play a cash game you don't have these considerations like how in the tournaments this uh stink in the tournament ev yeah is important and uh not everybody looks at it the same way someone don't respect it so much someone over respect it and play tighter than they should and this complicates the game so much, which is actually good. It's not like in cash games where you should just take the optimal decision mm. in this exact moment and not think about the future yeah. game so much. Maybe there are some situations like changing the dynamic and stuff. But usually you just want to take 
your optimal decision. Uh, in tournaments, it's very hard to estimate how important this thing in the tournament TV is actually. Yeah. And yeah. That makes it really interesting for me. Yeah, for sure. I uh, from cash game, so, I only yeah. know that future game consideration becomes important when you have a clearly weaker opponent. You have a spot on the table, yeah, and he has true. a big stack, like two hundred big blinds, and it's worth for you to double up to two hundred big blinds as well to play mm, even deeper with yeah, him, right? <laughs> but apart from that, yeah, you're right. You basically just want to make the best decision, and you don't really need to consider future game that much unless you have some sort of meta going on and you want to build a certain image and then you want to exploit that but you know if you play against on on these levels people might not even or might understand all right you know there's certain dynamics going on they might re-exploit you so then you end up leveling yourself so it's always a a very fine line between being a genius and, and being an idiot <laughs> You were talking. Yeah, you, right. you were maybe if he was blocking me now, I would be the the idiot. You know. Listen, I think uh, when you play on, at this stage, and now you're gonna be more in the spotlight. I think, and 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 I have to be honest. At the beginning, when I started streaming more often, and I started putting my plays on YouTube. Um, I was actually also a little worried how people might see me. And the the thing is, though, there's nothing you can do about it. You just need to accept it. I mean, you. You have certain reads on players and you got to make moves that might look completely retarded. You just, you only owe yourself, right? You just need to be honest did with you yourself. Felt like, hmm? Did you feel like people started changing uh, the strategy against you? I mean, yeah. I'm not sure if, if you say it now with your level and <laughs> for sure. Switch, no, but... I think, I think it's, it's also a challenge for me because first of all, it's, you need to be a bit more aware on the table what is going on. And since you also have probably have a lot of experience from spin and goals, I don't mind that. I don't mind playing mind games because I've been doing this for 10 years. I played in such a small yeah. pool. Uh, you as well, heads up hypers, high stakes. The, uh, the, the player pool is small. You have different player types. You know how they react. You have certain players. You bluff them once. They never fought against you. Even though one year later, you never bluffed them, they, they keep hero calling you, right? And then you have the ones that are also good at adapting. You can also sniff that out and, and, and use that to your advantage. And then you have those who uh, just keep being aggressive. Uh, then you have those you, they never, you never see them hero calling, so you can keep bluffing them over and over again. So I think, I think it's, it's, it's tougher, but I think in the long run, it also makes me a better player. Because I just need to really think exploitative and really try to think what is someone up to. And very often I fail doing that for sure. And I'm like, oh God, I never expected him doing that. But I think a majority of the time uh, with the experience I have, it actually really has helped me. So yeah, it's tough. And for you now, you since you're going to be in the spotlight, I think uh, you, people probably, everyone wants to bluff the WSP main event champion. Everyone wants to... I, I think that the challenge is because you will also have players who I don't want to yeah, mess up. I don't want to I don't want to mess around with this guy. People now now I'll be hero calling everything. So you know don't uh, don't try. It's <laughs> it's it's I think it goes both sides. What I've realized, people respect you a lot more, and they might even play less hands against you. You get away with more three bets and open raise, but then you also have those. No, I want to show this guy how good I am. And then yeah, it's yeah. it's it's your it's your job to find out who is who. Mm. But once you do, and it's 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 a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's when GTO comes when you don't know what to do, and then you have to be theoretically prepared. So you always well, but, but it's your answer. advantage it's your advantage because you have the experience battling in, in small player pools so you know how to adjust against an aggressive opponent you know how to adjust against the passive mm -hmm. usually when someone is too too tight to passive or he has those leaks he has not the experience yet so mm. you have the home advantage my friend i was actually so happy that um like uh, i was preparing uh for you and and uh european to 
maybe have some hands with you, you know. Yeah. I watch some some streams and uh, some panel tables of you guys. I was um, thinking that you might do it, uh, but uh, it didn't went so good for, for you. So the oh. panel table was actually one of the more easier tables uh, in the tournament, which I had. Yeah. Of course, being the chip leader helped a lot most of the time I was. Yeah. But yeah, I was and that was a good thing for me that <laughs> you didn't make it. Probably it hurts a lot. I had about some final tables in big events and it, it you always remember these opportunities. Yeah. Probably you being a, such a player had so many of those. Yeah, I'm... it's really painful, and and the double SOP main with such such a big first place, not making it probably it's really painful. How do you deal with that? It was actually it was just for one day. I felt a bit empty the next day. I was like didn't necessarily feel like start grinding, but if you if you really try, if you give it your best, usually it doesn't last long because. How can it feel bad? I think it only feels bad for, for a long time when you know that you, you were lazy and you didn't study a lot and you didn't do your preparation and then you still had the opportunity. It mm. feels like, oh, I, I could have gotten away with very little effort and a big reward. And then not getting it kind of feels like you also have a bit of, not just the self-help, self-hate, um, you feel a bit resentful towards yourself, not putting in the hours, not, yeah, not taking advantage of the situation, not not being prepared as you were supposed to, and then it feels painful. I think that's where that's where the pain comes from. When you really tried your best and it just didn't work out, you yeah, know sure. you're gonna get get another shot, right? So usually when it was painful, it was because I did mistakes, because I was not prepared mm. or I was distracted, and then it's like Ben, what did you do? What the fuck, like? Why didn't you take it more serious, right? And then you start blaming, also first you start blaming bad luck or whatever, and you don't want to admit that you fucked it up. And that's, I think, where the pain comes from. I think this is an important quality for a good and professional player, because this is a sign that you are looking for your mistakes, not just blaming work. Oh, this guy is so lucky, he won all the flips. Yeah. Could, how could I? was was this so important flip for my wife and my career yeah. and they they just focus on the big pots and ignore all the small ones which actually are huge like I, when i study it in spin and goals how significant are the small mistakes and how they change my chip pv and hourly it was significant just uh optimizing your bed sizing or your folding against the bed. That's really important stuff. And if you watch the flip, it's it's okay. I mean, that's the game. You you, you can't um, blame it. You you decided to play it. Uh, you you should be okay with everything which comes with it. You just have to play your best poker and try to make it better. Yeah. And uh, I think this mindset like I'm the same. It, if I make some mistake, it's really painful. I mean, it might be something which, when I analyze it, it actually looks okay. I mean, it's not a mistake. It's probably close in EV. Mm. But um, immediately after you bust, maybe a few hands after, you think about this hand, not not the the hand you bust. Yeah. Maybe if I did this there, it would be different. Something like that. Yeah, I guess this is a very good mentality to look for your mistakes and try to fix them. Yeah, for sure. Not only in and poker, but also in life, right? Mm, for <clears throat> sure. How do you, you were talking about spots that are close in, in EV. And I, I think this is where I see myself also struggling sometimes. And I think also a lot of players dealing with those spots where you're very uncertain. Is it the right play? Is it the wrong play? Spots that are very close in EV, are you someone that has no problem in letting go of them and accepting, okay, they're close, 
sometimes it is close. You're not always going to get quads and uh, straight flushes. How do you deal with, deal with that mentally and how do you be, how do you try to be, or how do you prepare yourself for those kind of spots um, when, you know, you're going to be in a merger situation? How do you, how do you handle those situations in, in that moment, but also afterwards then and, and not, you know, being too hard to yourself? Or are you, are mm -hmm. you maybe hard on yourself? <laughs> Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, well, um, when the tournament, like especially in this tournament, when it was really significant, mm -hmm. I tried to organize everything around me so I can have the best game I, I can have. And uh, I'm talking about my food, my workspace, all the small details I paid attention to before the final day because it was already a really big cash. I think um, when we started, the uh, we were already cashing around 40 or 50k, not sure. Yeah. So it was already huge. And um, I tried to optimize my time and use this week uh, to Actually, I think uh, even if I busted the tournament, uh, I'd still be really motivated because in this week, I escalated my game a lot, actually. Studying so much ICM stuff, so much uh, sim sims and um, replays and stuff. Uh, I, I felt like my games escalated so much and I was ready to jump in other tournaments and stuff. It went the best way it could, so uh, probably every thing of that uh, of the small things I do had his uh, place, and uh, it was important. You felt ready. And uh, I think when the, the the spot is close in EV, and and um, then this is really important because if you're a little distracted or something, you're not. You're missing some details of the hand, and there is so much thing in a hand. Like some hands look similar to each other, and maybe if you studied the spot with the solver, you know you know your decision. For example, short stack, ace high board in position. You just see, always see bet. Yeah. But uh, there's many like this. But uh, very often there is something different in every hand like there might be a fish in some of the position uh, positions so maybe you don't want to risk losing stack so you can pressure the fish or something all kinds of things can 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 be there um and um i think in this close detail in, in this close spots you should think about this stuff and uh think Maybe the tighter decision can help you because of that, or may, or making the loser decision can help you because of that. But you should be able to understand the benefits and the disadvantages of both, so you can take an easier decision. I believe in this close spot, this is how my mind works. Looking for some things on the background, which might be important if the EV is close. Yeah. And if I'm... If, and if I'm um, focused and did everything before the game so I can be focused, then I take very often better decisions mm. in these situations than my opponents. Yeah. That, that's how I think I approach those. Yeah. How, but how is it mental in case you, you end up being in a very marginal decision you, and you can't really say afterwards okay was it the right call was it the right forward or whatever and it's it's oh. it's there in your mind right for okay. a couple of hours or a couple of days is it something that stays for you very long and do you try to work on that or is it are you someone that has no problem with letting go of these kind of spots because i see especially in our community when people post hands you know you can really feel the way they're texting that they, these kind of spots are haunting them forever especially when it's a big decision mm -hmm. And I usually tell them, hey, listen, this is a marginal spot. Um, you can go broke, you can fold, it's it's literally whatever. And But you can see it's re really painful for them and it's haunting them for a very long time. How, how do you deal with all situations? 
Yeah, I think uh, this is some a little bit weak spot of mine. Uh, very often I think of those decisions, I continue to think of those decisions during my game because usually when I play multi tables, it's not uh, entities, sorry, it's not my usual game and I don't play many tables. I just uh, play up to four tables most of the time, some more significant tournaments. And uh, I have time, but um, very often when spot like this happens, I continue thinking about it after it's over. Hmm. And uh, many times, probably this uh, leads to missing other important information which I can focus on. Because the hint is over, it happened what it happened, and uh, it's not the time now to analyze it yeah you have it in your hand history you can review it later and i think that's the better approach but uh, i'm just so probably hard on myself and we are all so curious all for me if i made it yeah yeah if i made it right or not so it's a little bit hard for me to stop thinking about it but i think it's important yeah. And after a tournament, yeah, probably analyzing it, that actually makes you a, a lot more better because it's um, so boring to analyze some situations in solvers like browsing boards and stuff which are not emotionally connected with you. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, you, if you're analyzing a hint which was key for you in a tournament, then it's so more interesting and it gets in your mind for longer and uh, stays there because you're emotionally connected with, with this hand yeah so i guess um once once i analyze the spot i'm fine with it and yeah. don't uh, continue thinking about it and i think that's okay but sometimes if you dis if you understood that you made a mistake probably it can uh, make some make you feel bad or lose confidence or something but that's that shouldn't be true because you you did your work yeah. you analyzed it it's like probably a football football game the team gets and uh, review yeah. the, the match the defender had to do this in this situation that this is the important stuff why should you bother judging yourself yeah you did the job to, of, for analyzing it yeah but I can also see myself there sometimes that I'm being a little too hard to myself for too long, which which is draining mm. and which costs a lot of energy. So, um, but I definitely got. Yeah, I guess it has its positives and the negatives for sure. I mean, if you do that for sure, it's a sign you're getting better because you're thinking about your game. It's not like you're out there gambling. But at the same time, it might cut off the enjoyment of the game because there this is just suffering yeah <laughs> no for sure so you've been you mentioned at the beginning that you started cash game heads up you played spinning goals you played some uh, heads up hypers was it like you were grinding your way up that you started smaller buy-ins and then you you climbed up and then you ended up at 205 or was it more like okay i want to start right away at mid stakes i'm going to take a shot there yeah i was i always wanted to play some big stakes in my life i think uh i started it was so uh, so so long ago when i started i was a completely different person back then i have different expectations of poker and stuff to be honest i thought i, I would make a million when i'm 23 or 4 or something but uh seriously I didn't like the past years. I was uh, not even thinking anymore of this goal mm. because uh, I was more realistic about poker. But I always was com competitive, and uh, that's why I started playing heads up. Um, I think heads up is the most competitive form form because uh, the action is continuous and nonstop. You're heads up cash game or play. or setting goals heads heads up setting goals i guess every kind of heads up but especially in cash games 
you have a, li a little bit deeper stacks and um, maybe it's more stuff where you can do and um, your opponent is not you can make few you can make your opponent feel he is not certain about his play so this is a really interesting moment because uh, like the mind games huh? if you make your opponent uncertain probably you're the winner yeah <laughs> so that's why it feels to me like heads up is really competitive um i started playing this and uh i spent it three four years probably grinding heads up cash i reached some mid stakes uh, of course we didn't hit solvers back in the day we didn't yeah. have rangers everybody had his own vision of the game no one knew what is uh for sure yeah. the right play and this was different I, yeah it, it, it was more interesting i guess but not necessarily mo most in mo more interesting but it was different because uh everybody had huge ego that uh they know how to play and the other guys are fishes uh now you can just go in the solver and uh, see who who is right and who is not and of course there are still many factors which uh can make you deviate from but it's a little bit more clear now who is doing good and who no, uh, yeah. who not. Yeah. What do you think when you... Yeah. yeah, sorry? Maybe I get a little bit of the question. No, no. Whatever you feel, like even if it, if you touch base on some other topics, well, it's totally fine. I like to hear your your insights. And I also think our community really appreciates how, how a main event champion thinks and approaches the game. I think it, it helps us all. Um, so what, what do you think? I think someone submitted a really great question that fits really well in here was, what do you think are the main sticking points for mid stakes players that try to get to high stakes? I did some coaching with, uh, some people. Uh, I mean, I, I gave coaching to some people. I, I worked with higher stakes guys. I worked with smaller stake guys. Um, to be honest, to be honest, I feel like the higher stake guys are a little bit sharper. Um, they can, they get into more details. They imagine the range better. Like probably everyone has read or think about uh, how s certain players think more of their hand. Some s certain players think more of their opponent range. And there are players who think how bot ranges work together on some board. Yeah. So I think this is very correct. And the more beginner and uh, lower stakes players focus more on their hand. They don't um, explore their range in a situation and uh, find which hands are good for what and optimize the EV of the hands. Uh, there is like, poker is complicated game. There is a lot of think, a lot of stuff to think about, and um, the more factors you're considering, the better you are. So I think the uh, mid the the mid stake players and the low stake players think too basic for the game and uh, try to get uh, like some rules who they want to follow and believe uh, they will escalate them to some higher stakes yeah which might be true uh, in the beginning and they will help you beat the mm -hmm. lower stakes but at one point you just have to play smart and not follow rules i guess um for sure there are some rules but you have to understand the, all, all the thing how how it works. Like you did with your nut flush, right? I think if we if you play a low stakes tournament, you can never fold a nut flush there. The guy might overplay his his queen high flush. Like yeah. people don't understand poker that well, so it's it's easier to follow some rules like never fold a nut flush there. But then when you start playing bigger tournaments and when there's a lot of money at stake, you need to be a bit more smart on okay, 
so much there's a bit more money involved there's more psychology going on so you really need to consider the human aspects of the game here as well right so um i think that's a great example where you have been really smart about that decision whereas if it's like a ten dollar tournament your final two tables i would never i would always say this is a mandatory call whereas in your situation i think it's a great fault so you can't really compare yeah. the two mm, exactly oh, yeah, yeah. I I think like it's it was not so hard of a fault as we discussed the hint, but for some people it's they, a hard fault for sure. Like I, at least for me, if yeah, I, yeah, probably, I think there are a lot, a lot of reasons to fight. Oh, he okay, might turn be, his king be honest. Be honest with me. Like what percent of the time you're calling this hint? Uh, I would I can say with certainty. I would never call always. I would also never fold always. So it's between, I don't know, maybe 30% okay, of the time is, I'm then folding. Is, then is difficult. I would yeah, definitely sometimes fold, but I, I can see myself calling. Yeah. It really depends on, it really depends on the situation. You know, really, and actually I, I missed something about the hand, some important factor. The, the last hint of the day two, which finished at around nine, I'm not sure. It was very early in the morning. Uh, very very late in the morning yeah. actually uh whatever uh the last hand i was chip leader to the last hand of the day and then i was 10 big blinds to brian uh and he became the chip leader and in this hand we check 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 i check and he bet the river with an over bet and uh there were like 16 combinations of straight possible on the turn which he had to check back on the turn and not see better on the flop. It was really weird. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to hero call it. And he showed up with some uh, tricky plate straight. But uh, I was with some pair, so I showed myself being with uh, stationary tendencies. I mean, <laughs> being, yeah, being made, made some, some hero call there. So this was the last hint of the okay. tournament. The other hint, the, the other hint, it was the end of the day. And we started with this dynamic. We started the tournament with this dynamic. So basically this is the hint after this one. Hmm. With, there is a one week gap between these hints, but I think this is an important factor because uh, he wouldn't bluff someone. And, and that's why I think he sized up. He knows that uh, this calling tendencies and that probably makes made made him a bit bigger mm. and um this also me realizing this also helped me fold easier because i didn't thought he would make a sick buff against a player like me i know in the gto world this is a nonsense stuff but i think in reality it's something which yeah you have to consider yeah yeah, that's that's of course then a, a great re-exploit that you did there, right? It looked like it, yeah. Yeah, I have to say though, everyone that is listening or watching or whatever, um, you you have to be careful because I think I mean it's my opinion. You can you can disagree on that if you want. Um, I think though, if someone has a calling station tendency, they're usually not on your level that they understand the dynamics. They don't have the experiences you have. Only a few amount of people. So if I see someone is a calling station, he's not going to be like, oh, I need to adjust my range in that regards. Especially for low stakes and mid stakes players. If you face someone who is a calling station, he just likes to see flops turn into reverse. He likes to see your high end. He's curious, right? So don't think like, oh, now I'm going to re-exploit he saw himself or he realized he ca he called me very wide. So now he's going to overfold and then you try to start bluffing them. That's going to turn out terrible. Um, there might yeah. be some geniuses, even on low stakes, mid stakes. I don't want to say it, but it's like three out of 100 players. So, and you don't know who is who. So do you want to play a proper game against the pool, against the 97? Or do you want to make money against the three players? So I think it's more important to try to play your best game against the player pool, against the 100 players then identifying who are the ones that are able to exploit. You won't figure out anyway, and it takes you way too much energy away from other spots. So I think this is the population rate you should go with. 
and you always have to be very careful when bright minds like you are sharing these insights because it's on a very very high level that's like 0, 0.00 whatever percentage that this on, on of the stakes that is going on right like usually you don't have first of all that amount of money at stake this kind of dynamic going on and then two excellent players like you are battling against each other this is not representative of what is happening in poker usually right so please take it very uh, take it with a grain of salt for your own yeah, stakes that, that's a nice point totally agree because I feel like a lot of the players, they see their idols doing certain plays and then they try to mirror it onto low stakes. But no, play the game that you have to play on low stakes. That's why I also recommend players try to get someone mm. who is beating low stakes, who is playing low stakes. Try to learn from them. It will help you yeah, much better. Yeah, if we have to get back to the question, like I mm. think you asked... Uh, what would be an advice for some low stake player how to get into the higher stakes or the goals mm -hmm. he want to achieve <coughs> i think i think everyone should uh question himself always and not uh ever be uh confident that he already is good enough mm -hmm. in poker yeah I mean, in life, probably it's a good thing to believe you're good enough and have confidence, but um, that stops you from developing. Uh, yeah. I see, I saw, I've seen uh, many players judge other players, even they judge high stakes players by seeing a hint or something, but you don't know what's in the mind of this guy probably they had some dynamic there they probably probably there is a certain reason why someone did something yeah and uh try i i, I should advise people to try to stay away from this the judgmental mindset but more <clears throat> like understand what could be the factors of someone taking this decision which they are missing yeah maybe sometimes it was, sometimes it was a bad play but maybe sometimes they just don't understand something. So if you're a low stake player, just uh, always think what could could you do better? Like what are your biggest mistakes? Try to work with, with those, then continue looking for another mistakes, but always look for mistakes. Even now, I don't believe I am perfect player. I believe I'm a good player, but I know there is a lot of stuff I don't understand, especially in tournaments. Yeah, when I started uh, work, studying for the main event, I realized that there is so much stuff which um, I probably did uh, different and I could like um, optimize. Yeah. So I continue to have this mindset and uh, I will look for some uh, spots to play better. Yeah, nobody's perfect in poker. I think the moment you um, start and li listen, I had, let me think about it. But every student that is approached, that's why I'm also not doing private coachings anymore, only for the ones that I know that on a very professional level, that's what I enjoy. But when I look back and everyone that has approached me, Ben, I'm on a terrible downswing. Um, I think I play good. Or they, you know, you have the sense that they think they play good and they ha come to me, but they kind of like, I didn't, I never really felt a genuine that they like really admit that they do a lot of mistakes. I think they just very often see confirmation and confidence that, hey, yeah, you're actually really good. Just keep playing. But I have to say that everyone, everyone that, I even looked in a hand history or I look, looked into hands or I had coachings with and that approached me with like, yeah, I'm, I'm on a downswing. I, I'm not running well, but I think I'm playing good. I think I make good decisions. I think I beat my field. All of them. Terrible. There was not a single one where I said, yeah, you're, you're running really bad. Not speaking about the professions that I'm working with, like where they, the ones that are not playing full time necessarily, they try to make the step to full time where you could really see they don't understand the variance and they don't understand the complexity of the game. And I had to preach the same over and over again to tell 
tell, tell them a little bit more about variants and actually what they are supposed to do in certain spots and explaining a lot of basics. It's It was astonishing to me. And at some point, I, I just got so bored of it that I said, okay, this is not something I necessarily enjoy. I really want to work with players on, on strategic things and, and sharpening their games. And now when I re people reach out to me, like, Ben, you need to help me. Like, uh, can you look over my game? Like, I'm a terrible downswing. Okay, when, when, you, when you already have that mindset that you're on a terrible downswing, why do you reach out in the first place? Then you're on a downswing. Then keep playing. Right? Like, I wouldn't reach out to someone, hey, hey, I just have bad luck. Can you help me? Like, what the fuck? Then if you have bad luck, then just keep doing it. And then it's going to turn, turn around. Like, if you, someone who is lucky just tried a couple more times than someone who didn't have luck. So it's like they try to yeah. reach out and then be humble and or pretend to be humble and open, but they aren't really. They just want to have someone telling them, oh, you're doing fine. You're a great player. They just seek a little bit of that attention and that little bit of push. But usually I yeah. just want to tell them, no, terrible. <laughs> yeah, I think the mindset is a big thing in poker. And uh, you might not be a good player, but if you get if you have the, the the right mindset, you will become one at some point of yeah. your life, because yeah. you you will know what's up and you will try to get better. But if you don't have the right mindset, you might not uh, have this. Op you might not give this opportunity to yourself. Yeah. Dude. And yeah, an, uh, an interesting exercise which com comes to my mind is mm -hmm. take a paper or a notepad. Take a hand and try to write down everything about this hand, which uh, might be helpful for your decision. Not mm -hmm. that, not just I have a middle pair, so I call and yeah. finish right here. <laughs> but write down, like, take an hour or 30 minutes, whatever, at least 30 minutes, and try down and think and think and think and find out everything which might be some factor even if it is not just write it down about the hand mm. then give this uh, to someone who is good better than you or really good and um, ask him what he thinks about that if uh, if he can add something and if he he can add something to to this this can open your eyes so much for yeah it's a great way your thinking process yeah i like that exercise a lot so you basically making yourself vulnerable towards like sharing everything that comes to your mind for a hand. But then of course, also admitting the things you might not know. And then someone else get access to your thought process and can tell you, Hey, you're missing this, or this is the wrong approach. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah this, exactly. Yeah. This is also where I'm very strict in our discord community with when people post hand, you know, usually they just post a hand It's like, Hey, how did I play this hand? I usually delete this and I'm telling them, read the rules motherfucker because this is not going to help you how am i supposed to because some he could have played the hand brilliantly but he has the most fucked up reasons you can still play a hand well but you just got lucky playing the hand well but you actually have the wrong reasons so that's why i always tell people and i think they're very annoyed and a lot of people hate me for that but it's gonna help you i don't care i don't want to be friends with you i want to i want you to become a better poker player and i think that's the only way because then you can see, okay, what are your reasons for preflop? What are your reasons for C bidding? What are your reasons for hero calling? And usually mm -hmm. people say, I don't have experience doing that. Well, you lazy fuck, then don't expect us to put in, invest our time if you find excuses to not being able to share your thoughts. Because it's not because of experience, it's just because you're too lazy and you're too afraid to show, to be, yeah. to, to show vulnerability. But then don't expect anyone else spending time on, on analyzing your hands. Yeah, don't look for the easy ways, just yeah. look for the People, effective yeah. ways. Yeah, and also in studying, there is no easy way. And I think the most painful way for a lot of people is admitting how bad they are in certain spots, but that's all right. Like just just share the way you think about it. And I really like that. That uh, I think even writing down, it's like you really manifest things that you know about poker or you don't know and then later on you can have a look at it really that's how i thought about poker i had a notepad when i played sit and goes like every day i was taking some notes uh what could i have done better what did i do well what I, do i want to be working with 
I had like 50, 60, 70 pages at some point. And you, you could really see also the, the progress. It's really great to see because it's not tangible. It's not measurable. But when you write it down and you build some sort of archive, one year later, you can go back. Well, that's the way I thought about poker. Fuck, I was so bad. Right. And then it makes click. You can see, wow, I can really see a progress. And then that's then I didn't care about the results anymore. I could measure like not specifically, but I, I recent not so recently, but uh, I requested my hand history, my full hand history from poker stars. Uh, yeah, I wanted to check something and I don't remember <laughs> even what, but uh, they sent me my first hands from 2000 and something like 2009 or so, something i'm not sure it was so <laughs> funny to watch the, the hands which i played in the beginning and i remember those times that i was so confident and thought that uh i'm doing something better than my opponents and stuff and uh, some of the hands are completely just total fun nothing to <laughs> it was very I can imagine, yeah. Looking back in the days. I think Lex Felto has also did a YouTube video on his channel where he goes over old cash commands. I can highly recommend that. It's it's great. It's hilarious. Oh, yeah. Also with how he reacts to it, seeing his old Lex playing heads. You're know, like, what the fuck did you do there? And it just, <laughs> that, I think everyone, for everyone that, if you compare your game now with 10 years ago, you're probably going to be very ashamed. Yeah, it's your... funny because you remember your mindset back in the days and yeah. uh, maybe you were confident and look, what, look, look how good I play and uh, what do I do? And yeah. Uh, then. Yeah, for sure. Stoyan, man, do, anything else you. By the way, uh, something I would like to know, but I forgot. Well, how's the, how's the Bulgarian poker scene, by the way? Is it online and live like is it a very established poker scene do you have a lot of grinders do you have a community where you can interact with players yeah this is a small community but you are very connected and mm -hmm. helpful to each other uh there are some guys who play higher stakes many guys who play mid stakes uh and uh we always help each other with stuff you know uh, when we are I don't, I'm not um, in the MTT community, basically, but I know all the guys. We started playing poker, basically, at the same time. So we had many situations where we were together, maybe for some wife events, maybe for some other events. And uh, most of my good friends are actually poker players. Many of them play tournaments and um, there are many guys who do good. Probably you know them as nicknames, but I yeah. don't, I will not uh, go into it. And uh, especially when we go for some wife series, uh, we are always together. And um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's Bulgaria is very nice for poker, actually, because uh, it's very cheap here. It's really easy to live here a and good life with not so much money. Yeah, and uh, you're, if you're a good poker player, you're like some, you know, you can go <laughs> and have, you can go and live a very nice life, whatever you consider as a nice life. Uh, with, where is money included? I mean, going yeah. to clubs, um, going on vacations and stuff, you know, yeah. it's very easy to do that in Bulgaria if you are a good poker player. So that's why probably many of the guys still play poker who, who started uh, young, they still play. And uh, even if they don't do some huge money, some life changing stuff, they still can do like more than the average or like the average software engineer, for mm -hmm. example, in Bulgaria, okay. which is nice. Yeah. Oh, I'm, but <clears throat> for real, uh, from everything that I've seen in Europe, food wise, nothing can, uh, can keep up with Sofia. That's insane. Like the food there, it was <laughs> mind blowing. And also it's, it's very cheap. And then a lot of the restaurants, 
you also have a very high diversity they play are you like happy and all these places mm -hmm. and all like you get mm -hmm. sushi pizza meat salads soups yeah. everything and it's and then, insane then you're and quality <laughs> it's insane quality here in germany or in austria like you need to make a decision do you want asian food do you want italian food do you want vegan food vegetarian there you go to one place you get everything and it's outstanding I had my best sushi there. I had my best octopus there. The best salads. The salads are insane. The bowls are bowls are insane. It's not just one restaurant. It's everywhere. And I also had the best cakes. Every, every uh, uh, I had the best cakes there in Sofia. My girlfriend showed me a place. And I'm not the sweet candy type of person. But this was just... <laughs> no. I, every single time she goes back to Sofia, I tell her, please bring some of the cakes from that place. I don't... I don't remember the name it was. But anyway, yeah. Sofia, great city for sure. Um, you ever tried Banitsa? No. Uh, what was Banitsa? Next time again? you're in Sofia, give me a call. I'll yeah, no, no, I, I know it. I'm just... Did I try it or did my girlfriend already... Try? What was Banitsa again? But it's best if it's homemade. Usually the grandmas or your I mom think can I ate make it. it very good. I think I ate it uh, at my girlfriend's uncle and auntie's place but i'm not sure what what is what is it's what is not it made the best of? thing to eat before it's not the best thing to eat before a session it's very heavy it's right amazing. <laughs> what? what what is it what is it made of uh it's uh basically something like pizza i don't know it's uh i don't know the words in english there is included uh, cheese egg and also some um Mm, it's similar to pizza, but it's different. I think I think I ate it once. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure, but I'm going to ask her. She knows better. Oh, but uh, yeah, yeah, sure. food, food insane in Sofia. Uh, I was very surprised. I feel very nice in Bulgaria and uh, yeah. because it's very composed here. You can go skiing in the winter, then yeah. in the summer. Sunny beach. You drive beach. two hours with the car and you're on the seaside. <laughs> yeah. And uh, all the big cities are kind of close to each other. Plovdiv, Sofia. Yeah. And it makes it easier, you know. It, yeah. It's composed. Yeah. And nice. What's your, before we wrap it up, in, in these days, what would you recommend to beginners to, that want to start with poker? What would be your goal and advice? Yeah, well, just see what's popular nowadays and uh, try to do that uh, for, I mean, for coaching, um, uh, for studying uh, resources, like uh, see what are the actual content, video, videos, what, what what's, um, I always uh, look at the latest content because the, because things change. I mean, if you watch something from from three or four years ago, probably it was good back then. But the the, the game is constantly evolving. So if you're trying to find the content, look for the latest one. Actually, I recorded my final table, not my final table, but uh, since the end of day two, I recorded my screen. I think about making some videos about those, oh, analyzing cool. my game and stuff. Yeah, not sure how I launch it. We would be on a separate platform or maybe getting in contact with some of the other brands, not sure. But I have these videos and I want to probably analyze the hands and uh, launch this. So oh, you can, if I have some info more info i'll share it on my instagram you cool. can follow me there yeah sure Trian poker is my instagram yeah we're also going to put uh, your socials here on somewhere here down so people are going to know maybe you start your own youtube channel and put you. some of the stuff on there that would be exciting you haven't really thought about my future plans yet but we will see what what you great i'm excited mm. so yeah for the beginner players i think you you should definitely watch some content and um but but uh, that's just a part i mean the most important thing is to 
analyze the game and uh, look what what's useful and will help you the most. Just uh, <coughs> do what helps. Don't uh, waste your time by reviewing just reviewing the hints uh, in the replayer. And uh, it's basically like replaying your hint like you played it twice yeah you don't uh, you, rarely you will think something different yeah you have more time and stuff but use tools even if it's equal up draw some range out there this will help like you will understand better the combinations use every single tool which is out there if you want to be good and also find someone who will your partner that uh, if you do this alone there is a lot of things you will miss and if you're the more people you are the better chance someone will find something and share it with the group it's important to have yeah, a group yeah. that is how in bulgaria we work uh, also there are, everyone is working with someone and there is some big group where everyone is so you find information from different ways and use it just be smart and think what's best, not only in the game, but also outside of the game to get better. Yeah, that's great. I couldn't agree more. Thank so you. listen carefully, guys, to the main event champion. He is the main event champion for a reason. So you should take it very, very serious. Messi, as one says in Bulgaria, for coming to the podcast. I really appreciate it. And I think also we have can... another word. It's Blagodaria. Blagodaria. Yeah, I think Merci is the French which came in Bulgaria. Yeah, I've just heard it that you lose it a lot in, in Bulgaria, Merci as well, right? Yeah, we use it a lot. Yeah. Also. Great. So, thank you very much, Ben. It was nice to be on your podcast. We, we, we have to say thank you. And then all the best and then see you at the table soon. And then hopefully next time. Yeah, I guess we'll see each other at the table, table soon. <laughs>